Welcome everyone. Hi, I'm Deanna Cohen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Plastic Pollution Coalition. Today, I'd like to welcome you to Plastic Pollution Coalition's global webinar series, which brings together our community to share the latest information, tips, and resources to help stop the growing plastic pollution crisis. Welcome today to our August webinar, Plastic Free Outdoors, Honoring Nature, Preventing Plastic Pollution where we'll be discussing efforts to truly honor nature by keeping plastic pollution out of it, including the campaign to urge US Department of State Interior Secretary Holland to eliminate the sale and use of single use plastics in US national parks. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a, is a growing global alliance of more than 1200 organizations, businesses and leaders in 75 countries, working to educate, connect, and advocate for a just, equitable world free of plastic pollution. And of course, if you'd like to share any of this on social media, please tag us and our presenters. You can tag us at, at Plastic Pollutes. We're so honored to be joined today by these three expert panelists, moderator and panelists. Um, they'll be giving presentations about their work, after which we'll have a discussion with the Q&A. And I just want to say what an auspicious day for this webinar, because today is the 105th birthday of the National Park Service, which actually makes me feel emotional. So <laughs> happy birthday to the U.S. National Park Service. Um, our panelists uh, and moderator include uh, Heather White founder and CEO of One Green Thing. Heather is the former executive director of Yellowstone Forever and Environmental Working Group. Heather is an attorney and sits on the executive advisory board of Plastic Pollution Coalition, Sewell Belmont House and Museum, now the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, and the Center for the Environment at Catawba College, as well as the Aaron Brockovich Foundation. Heather received a BA in environmental science from the University of Virginia as an Eccles scholar and a JD from the University of Tennessee College of Law, magnum cum laude. Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much, Deanna. And thank you for everybody for joining us. I see that we have 100 participants on today's uh, conference, which is just wonderful to have you all here. As Deanna said, it's the 105th anniversary of the National Park Service. So what a wonderful day for us to talk about a plastic free outdoors. And even though the polls uh, weren't working, we look forward to hearing from you about your connection to the national parks. I know for me, uh, I had some pretty amazing experiences. I grew up in right near Great Smokies National Park in Knoxville, Tennessee. And then I, when I turned 12, my dad took me on this just amazing trip. It was the two of us and we did a two week trip out West and we went to Yellowstone, to Bryce, to Grand Canyon, to Mesa Verde, uh, to all kinds of just amazing national parks. And it was one of those incredible and life-changing experiences for me, especially seeing Old Faithful for the first time. That's when I really realized that I wanted to dedicate you know, my scholarship and my academic career to environmental science. So um, I think many of us have those special stories in the national parks. And as you probably know, the national parks were created in 1916 uh, by an act of Congress. And the mission of the parks is to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. And I think as we think about plastic pollution and we think about the challenges of climate change and the intersection between those two, our focus on future generation needs to continue to be front and center. The National Park Service, um, we've all had kind of our personal connections to NPS, but it manages 423 individual units as diverse as Yellowstone, which is the world's first national park, to National Historic Mo uh, Monuments like the Sewell Belmont House that's right at the Capitol building that commemorates Alice Paul and women's suffrage. There's all kinds of really fascinating and important stories that are preserved by the national park system. Um, and those units cover more than 85 million acres. So that's just kind of a background of NPS. 
Today, we're going to really focus in, though, on plastic pollution, specifically water bottles, uh, water bottle solution, excuse me, pollution in the national park system. I know when I first went to the, the Yellowstone, had my Yellowstone and Teton experience in the early 80s, um, there wasn't really a lot of plastic pollution. It's not something that we talked about during that point in time. But over the last 20 to 30 years, I think we've all seen um, litter all kinds of um, challenges that plastic pollution has created. And in fact, in the greater Yellowstone area, a great group called Adventure Scientists um, did a report just two years ago that showed microplastics in the Yellowstone River and in the whole ecosystem there. So we're seeing you know, microplastics in rain and snow, and we're seeing them throughout the, the national park system. Um, but today we're gonna talk about um, it in, on December 14th, 2011, the Obama administration established a very important policy that eliminated the sale of water in disposable plastic. And it encouraged filling stations, which I think many of you have seen um, that change over the last 10 years. And it was applied in 23 of 417 parks, including Grand Canyon, Zion, Bryce, and Mount Rushmore. And this policy had a pretty significant impact on reducing plastic pollution. Uh, it also included a $2 million um, of water bottles that were prevented from being purchased by having this policy. Um, this was a report that the Department of Interior did kind of evaluating the effectiveness of the policy. It also eliminated sales of water bottles um, up, up to 112,000 pounds of plastic from being sold um, and, and discarded every year. And that uh, translates into a savings of 140 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. So it was a significant carbon um, uh, impact too. And um, between 276 to 419 cubic yards of landfill space was saved. So that's the policy that was working. And then, of course, we know elections really matter, and they matter when it comes to the environment, and conservation, and the national parks. And on August 16th, President Trump rescinds this um, Obama policy memo and made it effective immediately. And with the welcoming of the Biden administration, more than 300 nonprofits, many of which um, are on this call today, organizations and businesses have really encouraged Secretary Holland to take a stand and reinstitute this policy to address single use plastic in the national parks. So we'll be talking and going into a deep dive about the letter that we're ur urging all of you to support and take action on, which calls for the elimination of the sale and distribution of polystyrene foam products and single use plastic bottles, bags, and foodware, including cups, plates, bowls, and utensils in the national parks. So uh, with that, I just wanna encourage you all to um, follow us to be part of this discussion, we look forward to going over many of the questions that you receive to us after we hear from our next panelist, um, our, our next two panelists, Sarah and Laura. So next, I'll turn it over to Sarah, and it's my uh, delight to introduce her, Sarah Barmeyer. Um, and Sarah is the Senior Managing Director for the National Parks and Conservation Association's conservation programs. There, she coordinates priority initiatives for water restoration, landscape conservation, wildlife, and clean air. Sarah holds an MS in Conservation Ecology and Sustainable Development from the University of Georgia and a BS in Biology from the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. Sarah? Great. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, perfect. And thank you so much to the Plastic Pollution Coalition um, and the countless partners here um, involved in this effort, including you all joining this conversation today. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit about MPCA. So MPCA is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and preserving our country's most iconic places for present and future generations. The part, uh, MPCA was actually founded in 1919, just three years after the Park Service was established by some of the same people that helped create the national park system to serve as an independent watchdog group. Today, MPCA has more than 1.6 million, uh, million members and supporters. 
An important part of MPCA's role as stewards of healthy parks is to make America's parks cleaner for future generations, which includes efforts to reduce and eliminate plastic pollution in parks. America's national parks are suffering from plastic pollution, ranging from large debris to microplastics um, from synthetic materials. Even in the most remote national parks, plastic pollution is inescapable due to waste generated by more than 330 million annual visitors who leave behind millions of pounds of waste bound for area landfills. So the Park Service manages 70 million pounds of waste each year. It's equivalent to the weight of 155 Statues of Liberties. We love national park comparisons for, um, you know, for, for metrics here. So and if you were to actually include the waste managed by park concessionaires, that number more than doubles. Single-use plastic waste is a significant source of the landfill waste that's coming into parks. So one of the things that MBCA is working on is we're working with Subaru on the Zero Landfill Initiative at three pilot parks, Denali, Grand Teton, and Yosemite, to significantly reduce waste at these parks. And I'll discuss some of these lessons that we've learned you know, briefly during this, this talk today. So in 2016, Subaru and MPCA conducted a survey and found that more than one third of park visitors bring single use water bottles to national parks and less than half of park visitors sort and recycle their waste before leaving. Park service staff and volunteers spend substantial time cleaning up trail and waterway litter, reducing wildlife and visitor hazards and hauling waste to landfills, which not only costs parks money, but also meaningfully detracts from the visitor experience. MPCA has learned that raising awareness through education can lead to positive behavioral changes that can actually reduce plastic pollution in parks. So at that point, we found that the survey, this whole survey found that nearly four out of five park visitors would be in favor of eliminating single use water bottles if they knew it would reduce waste and clean up national parks. It's really hard to talk about plastic pollution in national parks right now without noting the growth of visitation at our parks. And there is no reason to believe that increased visitation will let up anytime soon. June and July of this summer set monthly attendance records at many national parks, leading to multi-hour waits for popular trails, increased trash, wildlife disruption, and defacement of cultural artifacts. Arches National Park, which is shown in these photos, is having to turn away visitors on a nearly daily basis. Adjacent, Canyonlands National Park has already seen a 45% jump in visitation this summer alone. Yet between 2011, when the director's order for eliminating parks uh, for, uh, single use water bottles was, was uh, introduced and 2019, the Park Service actually lost 16% of its staff capacity while at the same time struggling to accommodate a 17% overall increase in visitation. So the decline in staff capacity and funding over the last 10 years really gives us a sobering view of the ability of the Park Service to successfully respond to rapidly evolving visitor use challenges, such as waste management, including plastic pollution. And so through our partnership with Subaru on this Zero Landfill Initiative, NBCA has found that working directly with national parks, park gateway communities, park concessionaires, and nearby businesses is paramount to reducing plastic pollution and its circulation in parks. Since the, launch the, since the launch of the initiative in 2015, the three pilot parks, again, Denali, Grand Teton, and Yosemite, have made significant strides by nearly doubling their recycling and composting capabilities and keeping more than 16 million pounds of waste out of landfills. In 2019, more than eight and a half million visitors to these three pilot parks contributed to nearly eight million pounds of waste left behind at those parks. However, through the Zero Landfill Initiative work, nearly half of that waste was recycled, composted, or otherwise not sent to landfills. Today, we have nearly 1,000 new waste recycling and composting containers that are strategically placed in high visitation and operational locations across each pilot park. However, we must do more to stop plastic pollution from entering parks in the first place which one of the main things we will talk about today here is advocating that the National Park Service eliminate the sale and distribution of single use plastics in national parks. There are also individual actions that need to be done as well from bring your own water bottle and coffee mug, knowing where the water refill stations are located. This photo shows the one at um, one of the ones at Grand Canyon, 
that has also has educational signage, which is very important to educate park visitors about the importance of this effort. Um, choosing sustainable souvenirs and supply choices, um, reusable bags, materials, things that can be reused, and avoiding buying single-use plastic items and disposing of them in the parks. Um, finally, I just want to mention that encouraging aggressive pollution reduction measures in gateway communities is shown huge impacts for or huge benefits for national parks. Much of the waste coming into national parks is not being purchased within the parks. It's actually coming from gateway communities. So when gateway communities take actions such as bag fees or, or styrofoam and plastic straw bans, these, these actions really do help contribute to waste from entering our national parks. So in closing, I just want to note that national parks are living classrooms where best practices and technologies can be leveraged to reduce and eliminate plastic pollution while also educating visitors from around the world how their actions can make a difference. I look forward to finding ways so we can work together on this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for that. We really appreciate it. And we are now uh, thrilled to be able to introduce Laura Levinson, who is here. Um, Laura is the Senior Director of Federal Policy at Oceana. She was a policy advisor for Speaker Nancy Pelosi, um, and Laura was deeply involved in the development of major environment and energy legislation. She graduated summa cum laude from Smith College with a bachelor's degree in government and a concentration in international relations. Uh, Laura, the floor is yours. Great, thank you for the introduction, Heather. For those not familiar with Oceana, we are the largest international NGO devoted solely to ocean conservation. And plastics are one of the greatest threats facing our oceans today. Marine wildlife are consuming or becoming entangled in the plastic flooding our ocean. And this poses a great risk to the health of marine ecosystems. Our national parks are very relevant to ocean conservation. Of the 423 units in the system, 88 are coastal or ocean parks. To have an impact, we must reduce the amount of single-use plastic that is being produced. An estimated 33 billion pounds of plastic are entering the ocean every single year. This is roughly equivalent to dumping two garbage trucks full of plastic into the ocean every minute, every minute. There isn't a place on earth untouched by plastic. It has been found everywhere, even in rain in our national parks. A study attempting to quantify the amount of microplastics in the world's oceans estimated up to 5 trillion microplastic particles were present in the ocean in 2014. And this number is expected to increase as plastic continues to pour into the ocean and fragment into smaller and smaller pieces. Oceana is focusing our advocacy on reducing the production and use of single-use plastics, which are the most commonly collected items in beach cleanups. Every year, the Ocean Conservancy organizes an international coastal cleanup in which people from all over the world collect and record the trash they find along their coasts. The data is compiled into an annual report revealing the most commonly collected items. So on this slide, you see some of the most commonly collected plastic items of 2019. Next slide. And if that isn't disturbing enough, plastic production is pollution. Plastic production isn't slowing down. In fact, it's growing faster than ever. The plastic industry is aiming to drastically accelerate plastic production to 2050 and beyond. Putting the burden on consumers and municipalities will not work. Companies are simply forcing too much plastic into the market and are not offering plastic-free choices to consumers. So even if you want to avoid plastics, you really aren't given a choice, as we all know. Oceana's approach to plastic pollution has three prongs. Obtain local, state, and federal policies to reduce the production and use of single-use plastics, including actions by federal agencies such as the National Park Service. Two, create plastic-free zones, such as on university campuses. And three, get companies to offer plastic-free choices. Oceana has produced two major reports in 2020 on plastic pollution. One of them is on Amazon's plastic pollution, revealing that Amazon, the corporation, generated enough plastic packaging waste in 2019 to circle the earth 500 times in the form of plastic ear pillows. Also this report in which Oceana found evidence of close to 1800 marine mammals, such as seals and whales and sea turtles from 40 different species, swallowing or becoming entangled in plastic in US waters 
between 2009 and early 2020. 88% of these animals were from species listed as, as endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Again, those were marine mammals and sea turtles. The biggest problem Oceana found was animals consuming plastic. Oceana's campaign to reduce plastic pollution in the ocean by reducing production of single-use plastic led us to join with a number of other organizations to push for a ban on unnecessary single-use plastics in national parks. So why the focus on national parks for us, Oceana? The high profile of the national park system provides a great opportunity for the federal government to set an example and educate the public. As Heather already described, this push builds on previous efforts to reduce plastic and waste in national parks. And as Sarah explained, plastic pollution is a large and growing problem in our parks. In July, more than 300 organizations and businesses joined together to send a letter to the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, urging her to direct the National Park Service to ban the sale and distribution of single-use plastics in national parks. And Heather showed the list of items that we're proposing should be banned, which goes well beyond the Obama administration's policy that focused on single-use plastic water bottles. If Secretary Holland instituted this change, the Park Service would also make an impact on the climate crisis and on environmental injustice, two of the Biden administration's goals. Plastic contributes to climate change at every single stage of its life cycle. And plastic production facilities, incinerators, and landfills are often located in low-income communities and communities of color, where they pollute residents' air, water, and soil. One of the next steps is to encourage individuals to sign petitions supporting this policy change in national parks. And Oceana and several of our partners are already or will soon be circulating petitions for individuals to sign. When we have an impressive number in hand, we'll deliver them to the secretary. We are also working with members of Congress to put pressure on the Biden administration to ban single-use plastics in parks and other federal agencies. When your bathtub is overflowing, you don't run for a mop before you turn off the faucet. We need to turn off the faucet on plastic pollution. There is my contact information. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions, but of course, we now have a Q&A period. Thank you so much uh, for that, Laura, and thank you, Sarah. We uh, covered so much in a short amount of time, and now we're going to dig in with a lot of questions. But we've heard of the parks as living classrooms. I loved how you both pointed out how important the parks are for setting an example when it comes to environmental stewardship, which is why Oceana is involved in, um, in, in, in this case in particular, um, how the parks are being loved to death. I know um, I'm usually in Bozeman, Montana, that's where I live and the whole greater Yellowstone, it was just a crush of visitors that we had this summer once again. Um, five trillion pieces of plastic particles in the ocean, that's just mind boggling. Um, it's wonderful that we have coastal cleanup days and ways for us to take individual action. But when you shared, Laura, that we are going to see a quadrupling of plastic production, this is just one of those moments that I think makes us all pause. Um, and this is a question that actually came to us uh, when PPC asked for folks who were coming to the panel to suggest questions. And this really is, what can we do? And this is targeted to Laura and Sarah, I'll ask you to, to chime in too. What can we do to stop the flow of items being made from plastic? How do we actually start at the faucet? Because we know we can't recycle our way out of this problem. So Laura, tell us your thoughts on that. Yes, well, our focus at Oceana is on reducing production of these single-use plastics that are made essentially to last forever, but used for only a few moments and then thrown away. So we are actively advocating for bans on these kind of single-use plastics that we list in the letter. We're, ad we're advocating at the, the local level through local ordinances. We're advocating at the state level. We're ad ad advocating at the federal level and, and, and strongly support the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act in the US Congress. And we're also advocating in other countries. For example, Oceana in Chile was instrumental in passing, already passing through their national legislature, a really strong law to ban certain kinds of single-use plastics. So uh, policies are, policy change is essential. We, we, all, you know, we all try to work on this at the personal level, but we can't solve this problem at the personal level. So I would certainly you know, encourage folks to join in these sorts of um, 
advocacy efforts and to pressure your elected officials at, at every level. So uh, bans, obviously, you know, there are certain kinds of single-use plastics that we need in, in um, medicine and so on. We're not talking about those. Um, there are certainly other approaches, taxing, uh, requiring more recycled content in these products, uh, labeling them accurately, um, requiring increased recycled content. Those are all, those are some of the solutions that are included in the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And, and we oppose false solutions, including incineration, which, which um, puts toxic pollution back into the atmosphere and particularly impacts frontline communities around these plants, which are typically communities of color. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for making that connection to environmental justice too. I think that's an important part of the plastic production story. Also, uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. It's one of my favorite quotes from my seventh grade social studies teacher. Just the idea of not only getting involved in the consumer choices that you make, but really using that phone and getting a piece of paper and a pen out um, to write a letter to a member of Congress or state legislators. So thank you very much. Um, Sarah, is there anything you'd like to add with respect to that question? I know we have lots of other questions. I think um, that too. Laura really covered, covered it super well. I, I will say one addition that we've been working on is even once the, um, the rescinding of the policy came forward, um, parks are still working to put in refill stations, which I think is an important thing for people to know that parks have to have refill stations and it's not an overnight thing to ensure that you have clean drinking water. Um, I noted one of the questions that there, there are water quality concerns. We see places like Flint, um, you know, people are scared to drink water. Well, people don't also know like bottled water is basically coming from the same source too. So there's the educational, uh, you know, awareness about this. But with uh, the photo that I showed of the Grand Canyon, they have so much amazing educational signage. I think that the educational piece of this just has to be with this to increase you know, awareness and also just comf like people getting more comfortable with drinking water out of the tap, but also knowing that like that's, that's also what you're drinking out of bottled water. Um, in some places, it can be hard for parks if they don't have a drinking water supply. I mean, some of these can be really remote areas. So you know, just in telling park visitors, you know, making sure they are bringing their own reusable water bottles in advance, um, not contributing to the waste stream that's in these parks, I think are just really important elements also as far as like once you're at the park that you can do too. Yeah, and I think there's an important distinct distinction between emergency situations and recreating yeah. uh, in the park too. And as we're talking about access to, to water quality. Um, and so the other question I have, um, and Laura, maybe you go first and then Sarah will be next, is uh, what are your recommendations that will cut down um, on plastics that are used at park restaurants or in park lodge accommodations? I'll talk briefly. I think Sarah probably has the most comprehensive answers to this one, but uh... Many of these facilities are run by concessionaires, so the Park Service will have to have conversations with them about changing their practices. Uh, we at Oceana and many of our allies are promoting refillable solutions for um, foodware and beverages and you know, to replace these disposable single-use plastics. In terms of lodging, we are working in, in some states to support um, phasing out in hotels and other lodgings of those little plastic bottles of shampoo and lotion and all those things. We don't need those. If you're like me, you collect them and you bring them home and you put them in a tub because you can't stand the fact that they're just going to throw them away. <laughs> put them in a, you know, put them in a bowl or something uh, to use later. But, um, but really, all those can be replaced with, you know, dispensing machines where you just get a squirt of the shampoo or whatever it, it is that you need and don't have to have all that nasty plastic trash to throw away. <laughs> Sarah probably has more interesting things to say on this topic, actually. I don't know. I think I think those are all, all great, Laura. And it, it's, it really comes down to the park concessionaires in many ways. And a lot of that's, you know, part of the park management plans from the start of how parks are going to engage with park concessionaires who are supplying the restaurants, the visitor centers with these items. So ensuring that you know, these items aren't even there to begin with. I will make one note about this. 
a lot of the same concessionaires who are doing this, who are, you know, providing services facilities at national parks are also doing like football stadiums and large arenas. I mean, these are the same companies. So when you're dealing with national parks and concessionaires, like just think even like bigger, like think of stadium crowds, what, what these exact same companies should be doing <laughs> to be way more accountable from bottles to food packaging. Um, there's, there, there's just such a huge part of this um, from the start. And there's a lot that, that people can do too with the park management plans, obviously there are comment periods that you can weigh in on, but even when you go and visit these places, tell them that they don't need to be serving this, that there are other options. You know, once people, you know, start like letting people know that these aren't what you want to see in these places. Like when you go to national parks, you want to see, feel like they're these, you know, clean, pristine places. Sadly, they're not. And these little bottles are contributing to the waste stream that are in parks. And it's, you know, incumbent on these concessionaires to do their part up front so that they're, you know, they're part of the solution as well. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for also pointing out that culture shift that we're start starting to see with, you know, more filling stations, not just in parks, but in big stadiums and all these uh, folks and the, the leadership that concessionaires can play too in response to consumers. So I see we've gotten a couple of questions in the chat. I know, Sarah, that you had mentioned the question about water quality and you know, access to clean water and how important that is. Um, another question is about Maine's recent EPR law and how that can contribute to the solution. And also apparently there's a ballot measure in California that's similar to the EPR effort. Are those on your radar, Sarah, Laura? Can um, either one of you respond to that? They're definitely on our radar. Uh, I, however, cannot speak to the details of those. Oceana is very involved in California legislation and in that and in that drive, but I'm not the person handling it, so I'm sorry. I'm not able to wade into the details, but um, kudos to Maine for moving forward. Uh, they also are one of the states that have held on to their bottle return law. I was just in Maine, and we, at the end of our visit, we put all of our bottles and things into a bag, and we put them into a bin um, to support the local animal shelter. They'll take them to redemption and collect the money. So Maine's been a leader for a long time. Sarah? Yeah, um, I, these are all great, great things. I mean, I, I mentioned already local governments, states as well. Um, it makes a huge difference when, when other entities are getting involved because oftentimes it's you know, depending on your, your local grocery store, um, I was thinking Publix being from the South, which is where, where I'm from, um, you go by there and you go pick up the bottles and, you know, then you take those to the parks and have your picnics and then you put them in the trash can. Like often, like they're not coming from the visitor center. So parks have the role at the visitor center to educate people about even what they're bringing in from outside. And certainly, you know, state and local, um, you know, policies can really contribute to making a huge difference in these places. I mean, it's it's actually, I think that that could be where some of the biggest impact could come from. So, you know, parks like Acadia, which is also experiencing like huge overcrowding this summer. I mean, just thinking through the trash that could be reduced through a policy such as this is really, I mean, there, there are a lot of, this, it gives me a lot of hope to see things like this. So yeah, I think these are these are great initiatives that can certainly benefit parks as well as other communities in the state. So. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, question for you, Laura, that came in too um, with the panelists who are, excuse me, with the, the folks who are, who are listening into this panel right now, is just a question about why plastic pollution is supposed to quadruple. What's going on? What are fossil fuels, fuel companies doing? Would love to get your thoughts on that. Fossil fuel companies see plastic as a huge market growth area. They are kind of finally waking up to the fact that there's going to be less, increasingly less use of fossil fuels for energy purposes. As folks may know, renewable sources of energy are actually overtaking fossil fuel sources and becoming cheaper in many cases, not just hydroelectric power anymore, but wind and solar. So. Uh, so they see that their market is shrinking on the energy side, though they're certainly fighting tooth and nail um, and unfairly in any way they can to hold on to that market, uh, but they see plastic as, as a huge growth area. So they're planning new 
uh, production and planning new extraction of oil and gas um, in order to feed this market. Thank you, Laura. That is uh, very sobering, but true, right? As, as we see the clean energy sector increase and, and more and more people asking for that, we're seeing uh, this other kind of doubling down on consumer goods and plastic. Fascinating. Um, question that also came to us, Sarah, is about sustainable hiking and camping. Do you have any uh, tips, suggestions? I know you covered a little bit in your presentation, but love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, another group we work with is Leave No Trace, which I think that they have a lot of great practices as your, you know, just even the basics, what you bring in, take it back out. Like, don't leave anything behind. Just it, it, that should be like a standard principle when going to parks. Parks aren't waste management companies, yet they're having to, to juggle with all of this waste that's coming in. Um, there's also just knowing where, like where waste goes and also how you can dispose of it properly in parks, I think is really important. I know recycling isn't always the solution. Well, it should not be the solution. We want to eliminate this to begin with, but there are important ways that we can be recycling as well as composting different forms of waste that come in that have really helped parks be able to sort of manage their entire waste flow. Um, and then just education continues to be, you know, one of the things that I think is so important from, you know, where you're, you know, going to buy your outdoor equipment, um, you know, knowing what materials to get, um, fabrics, different things like that, I think are just huge, you know, ways that, you know, you, you can do these practices in a more sustainable way. I will say that um, in Yosemite with the Zero Landfill Initiative, one of the things that we found was that, you um, leftover like tents and sleeping bags that that's actually like when things rip or something people just throw them away that's a huge source of waste that yosemite is dealing with for example and they were able to partner with a local group that actually helps repair some of these things and then put you know give these away to um underserved communities where they now have this equipment that has been repair that did not, that wasn't even that hard to repair, but people just want to take the easy way out and throw it away. So there are just really choices that you can make about, you know, what you purchase, what materials it's made of, and then, you know, your willingness to make, maybe take a few minutes and fix that zipper instead of just throwing it away. Um, I think it's, you know, just, this, just, you know, I think that there's just so many personal decisions that you can make that can really help with a lot of this going forward. Thank you, Sarah. I didn't even think about that, right? I, I didn't think about people throwing away their sleeping bag or tent, but that's yeah. fascinating while they're camping, right? That yeah. That is fascinating. Like, oh, it's thing. leaking. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll just get a new one. Um, so just a question that's related to that that came up and maybe um, uh, Laura could talk about it and then we'll shift to, to you, Sarah, is how can we tap into this love of nature? You know, we're talking about plastic-free outdoors. How can we talk about this love of nature, tap into that in order to get these behavioral shifts that we need to see? Well, sometimes I suspect that it's more the ick factor of plastic that's uh, motivating people to take action against it, uh, which is, of course, connected to the love of nature. It's seeing, seeing nature in beautiful places that we delight in with trash in them and seeing animals that we care about with plastic entangled around them. So I, I think the love of nature is there. Unfortunately, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing these kind of nasty things around us in nature. So most important, I believe, is empowering people to, to know that they can do something, that they can make a difference, that we can make a difference, both in our personal actions and through collective action. And empowering people toward collection act, collective action is, is what we try to do at Oceana because a, each one of us alone can only do so much, but together we have great, great power and we need to exercise it with, particularly with our elected officials to counteract the, the power of, of the corporations that are pushing these plastic products out into society as fast as they can. Well, that's kind of a roundabout answer to your <laughs> Amen. question. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Sarah, anything you want to add? And then I want to circle back to companies because that just came up in the chat too. 
Yeah, I'll, I I agree with what Laura's saying. Um, I, you know, just you know, one of my favorite things about working for MPCA is being able to work on conservation issues through the national park lens because people are familiar with national parks and they are wanting to, you know, go to the national parks in their head. It's like these great pristine places that they're going to go see that, you know, these unparalleled vistas. Um, beyond plastic work, I work on water um, policy work too. And more than half of our national parks um, have impaired waterways. They don't meet Clean Water Act standards. People tend to be surprised that like, wait, what? Like if our national parks are, we're treating them this way. I mean, imagine everything else that is in our country and what we're doing with it, which we know that these are huge concerns. Um, so just sort of showing like these are huge issues that parks are facing that, you know, bringing that to life that people, people love nature, they love parks, but maybe they didn't connect those two together, that these are real issues that, um, that parks are facing, that our public lands are facing, even, you know, our beaches beyond national parks, we're, we're, they're just plagued with plastic pollution in so many ways. So, you know, just sort of bringing that reality to light, I think is big. I think the wildlife angle is also huge with this. People love wildlife. Um, wildlife, you know, really, it connects with people. People want to go see sea turtles and those kinds of things. And when you see like the sea turtle with the plastic straw, I mean, it's, it's disturbing and it's, people don't want to see that with wildlife. So I think, you know, talking about this through the wildlife lens, I noted, um, one of the answers, uh, one of the questions that that in one of my slides, there was a bird full of plastic pollution. It's got that photo was from Midway um, in the Pacific. So it's just like, this is happening all the time. Like these birds are filled with plastic in their guts. Like people just, you know, seeing it is like, it's very eye opening. And it's also like, what, like, what are we doing to our planet? And it's certainly these protected places like we sh we should just be doing a better job if you care about these places we need to think about what behavioral shifts you know we can make and also you know putting that on to the polluters as well I'd say so well speaking of may, polluters oh go, go ahead Laura. I just wanted to briefly add that I think that that um, art and music have great power also to bring these these concepts home with people for those who have those talents so I wanted to say that as well Oh, I love that. I think that's so important. We need everyone involved. <laughs> Bring your unique talents, please. Uh, we need you. Uh, so we have about two more minutes before we need to do our wrap up. And we have two important questions. The first is for Laura. Uh, are companies being approached directly for the petition that we're talking about to Secretary Holland? Well, the letter that we already sent to Secretary Holland, we did, we did circulate that not just to NGOs, but to to companies that are allies in this effort and a number of, of companies did sign the letter. I think we're talking about smaller companies here. We're not trying to get, you know, Pepsi Cola or, or, or big, <laughs> big companies that are on the other side of the fence to sign the letter. The petition that we're talking about is for individual persons okay. to sign. Great, but you do yes. work with companies. I know Plastic Pollution Coalition does too. And, and Deanna, maybe in our wrap up, you can address that too of all the members of the business community that are part of the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Uh, yes, absolutely. We work great. with companies that, you know, that align with the goals that we're seeking to obtain. Because the market change is, is, is as important as the policy change, or at least is an important level, lever in the changes that we need. Um, Sarah, the, the last question before you wrap up is um, for you. We've gotten several educators reaching out to us asking how can we incorporate this message in K through 12. Um, advice you have, I know MPCA has all kinds of great resources, so does Oceana as well. Yeah, I love that. And you had mentioned, Heather, your social studies teacher, and then Laura sort of building off the arts and crafts um, theme too. Kids make amazing crafts and it's fun to go into visitor centers at parks and see like what, you know, local elementary schools kids have done with various crafts that could be from plastic pollution to highlight these, you know, the, the what's, what's happening at these parks. Um, we've done a few projects. We've worked with some of the parks with projects that bring in artists that, um, you know, showcase some of this stuff. And, you know, having kids work on this is always such a great thing too. Um, you know, I will say that I, I've, I've found that actually I, kids and my, my kids, they tend to be, uh, you know, getting taught in school about plastic pollution issues, which I think is fantastic. Like I will say, 
I feel like they're learning more than I did about plastic pollution at their age. And also kids love telling adults what they're doing wrong. So I think that's always a great thing to have, you know, your kids reminding you like, maybe you don't need that plastic water bottle. If I'm using a reusable bottle, why can't you do that too? Um, you know, there are great ways to get kids involved with some of this and the, there are many educational opportunities. Um, just also thinking, you know, you're never too young to write letters either. We work with um, youth, you know, different ages of youth groups around the country who will send letters to their member of Congress um, advocating for a variety of issues that they're seeing at national parks, including plastic pollution. Um, we've done some work in South Florida around marine debris where um, students are writing in with concerns about, you know, you know, member of Congress, like we need you to address these issues that we're seeing. Um, so there are just many ways from the arts and crafts angle to like, you know, you're never too, you're never too young to be an advocate to help with some of these things and finding ways to elevate those voices and using them, I feel like are just great sort of civic voice lessons for, um, for years to come that, you know, starting with kids in elementary and middle school can really take those lessons and learn throughout life that, you know, you know how to, you know, work the public process, tell people what you need um, and what you want to see in places. So I, I think that, you know, harnessing that energy from kids is one of those powerful things that we can do. Also spoken like a true parent. Kids <laughs> love telling you when you're doing something wrong as a, as a grown up for sure. That's fun. Uh, well, we are uh, almost at the end of our hour here. So I'd love to hear kind of your, you know, last closing thoughts, uh, Laura, and then we'll shift to Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. I loved uh, what you said, Heather. Uh, democracy is a um, now I've lost it. It's a participatory. Yeah, it's not a spectator sport. sport. Yeah, it's not, not a spectator, spectator, spectator sport. sport. <laughs> totally agree with that. Also, um, persistence pays off. So I would encourage folks if you're not already connected with uh, with one of the organizations involved to to join up and participate in collective action, but also know that your individual persistence can really pay off in terms of. Uh, pushing your elected officials to put strong policies in place to reduce the production of single-use plastic and other plastic waste. And I also want in my closing remarks to acknowledge the stewardship of native people of the national park lands that are now part of the National Park Service and acknowledge that many of them were forcibly removed from those lands when they became parks. And we have uh, signers from um, tribal organizations on our letter to Secretary Holland, and we applaud her as the first Native American to lead the Department of the Interior, which is the main interface between the federal government and, and uh, Native people. So I wanted to be sure to, to acknowledge, um, again, their stewardship and to thank you all for uh, listening to our comments. Thank you, Laura. And that's such an important point too. There was a terrific Atlantic article, if any of you saw it, the cover story about returning the national parks to Native Americans. I think there's really important stories that we're still learning and uncovering and stories that need to be told, but the leadership of Secretary Holland and the tribal members um, and all of these issues, but particularly in plastic pollution, we're really grateful for. Thank you. Sarah? That's, that's a hard, hard one to follow, Laura. <laughs> you covered that. You covered it all. And I'm in a complete agreement from, you know, just this thinking about individual actions that you can do um, from waste on your own end with like your family to then thinking of actions and educating of others, sort of building out from individual actions and just it, it can grow like it can, it can your actions can make a big difference quickly. Um, and don't think that, you know, just one action that you're doing may not make a big difference. It takes a lot of small actions to see change in the space. Um, so yeah, I just, I think that that's an important reminder. Um, I love the tribal aspect with this. I think that there's so much we can learn um, from how we treat the land and how we should be treating the land now from those who were on the land um, well before parks existed. Um, so I just, I think incorporating that and highlighting that is a big opportunity um, that the secretary has right now. We also have um, a park service director nominee who, who gets this as well. And we have not had a director of the park service in over four years now. So just even having a park service director 
um, you know, also a Native American, there's, there's just so many benefits to sort of seeing where things are going right now and the momentum within the Department of the Interior, as well as the Park Service that, um, that I feel like with this issue, we're, we're in a good position to make a big difference coming up. So well, thank you. Sarah. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Diana, for hosting us. And before I turn it over to you for the final uh, conclusion, I just, my message to everyone who's joined us today and so many people around the world are, are listening to this and obviously care about this issue is um, try not to get overwhelmed, right? When you start thinking about all the data and all the things we need to do. I mean, for example, when Sarah, you're talking about the 303D impaired waterways in the national parks, you know, we think of these places as pristine, but they're challenged with plastic pollution, they're challenged with water quality issues as well. Remember to lean into hope and lean into that impact, just like Sarah and Laura were saying, we really can make a difference and we make a difference together. And that's what the organization that I founded, One Green Thing, is all about, is how these small actions can really snowball and, and really um, make a huge difference. So thank you all for taking time out of your very busy lives during a global pandemic to talk to us about this global issue and, and our perspective from the national parks. And with that, I would like to um, just let you know, it's just been an honor of my life being on the Plastic Pollution Coalition Executive Advisory Board. And I'm thrilled that Diana is going to sign us out. And I encourage you all to check out her artwork because when Laura was talking about the importance of art and music and the creative um, arts in really sharing that emotional message that we need to change ind individual behavior, Diana's at the front forefront of that and Diana and Julia. Thank you for everything that you've created with the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And now thank I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Heather. I, I just want to say thank you to, to you, Heather, and to Laura and to Sarah for being part of this conversation. It's a really important conversation. I'm excited about it, and I feel like we could have multiple, you know, future conversations about this as it all evolves and develops. Um, I don't think I said this in the beginning, but just on a personal level, we grew up going to Yosemite and other national parks. Uh, we're based in, well, I'm based in California and it just meant so much. It was really seminal in our childhood and upbringing to be able to have those experiences uh, with nature, we're part of nature. And obviously it's an utmost you know, importance to protect it. Um, and so with that, I say thank you to everybody. I wanna also, again, let you all know that you know, happy 105th uh, birthday to the National Park Service. And we want to invite everyone to please support this action and the letter to Secretary Holland. Um, no single use plastics in our national parks. You can sign the petition. It's a petition to eliminate the sale and distribution of single use plastics in our national parks. So we put the link in the chat and please help support that and share it with your personal communities or your work communities as well. Um, I wanna thank our speakers today, our panelists and our moderator for this valuable conversation. And um, I, I just realized that for six days in 2021, all the National Park Service sites, um, they, they're gonna, oh, sorry. They're gonna actually choose six different National Park sites and they will waive the entrance fee and you can go to the website for the National Park Service and learn about which ones those are if you'd like to visit a national park on one of those days. Um, so again, I'd like to encourage you guys to support this uh, letter to Secretary Holland and also invite you to please save the date for our next webinar, which will be on September 29th. And the topic is plastics and climate. Uh, obviously, we invite you as well to get involved with us. We invite you to connect with us on social media to learn more. We'll be sending out um, a follow-up survey, and we'd love to get your feedback. And we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And a big thank you to the Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar with their communities and networks. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in September. Thank you.